right down to the positioning of the head and the corresponding expression. Nothing can be added or taken away without degrading what the shroud image presents as self-evident. So, as the, as the veil of Veronica has been referred to as Christ's own self-portrait, this auto-self-portrait of Christ I refer to as a new Vera icon, a new true image. Like all self-portraits, it reveals insights both personal and profound about the inner state of its creator. Perhaps the shroud image with, it, with its definitive likeness could provide a, a significant challenge to artists of the future interested in the visual portrayal of Christ. Um, but anyway, with the, 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 the uh, retrieval of the visual data in the banding region and adjustments made for variations in the body cloth distance, the distorted look is reduced and the image looks more normal. Uh, the transformation is quite dramatic, and yet the visual data that comprises the essential shapes are the same as the original. The overall size of the face in the enhanced version seems to be in better proportion to the rest of the body than the original, especially relative to the hands. And I mention the hands because um, in discussing the overall anatomy of the shroud image, the possibility of anamorphic distortion due to the image being mapped onto a topographically irregular surface should be considered. A study of the hand area of the shroud uh, showing the estimated width of the hand Um, may prove helpful as it is assumed that this particular area of the shroud's image contains little or no anamorphic distortion and is therefore useful as an anatomical constant with which to compare with, um, for instance. Generally speaking, uh, sorry, generally speaking, uh, the width of one's hand is approximately the distance between the edges of your eyes. Um, this suggests that what appears as the side of the face is really part of the front of the face. The actual sides of the face are in the area of extreme image drop-off of and uh, that continue into the area of the hair as shown in the adjusted image. Certain nuances uh, become quite clear in the enhanced version. For example, the head is not perfectly frontal facing, but rather slightly tilted downward and to its right. The head appears to be tilted very slightly, approximately two degrees to its right side. Uh, the tilt of the head, it's not easily, easily recognized in the uh, original, but uh, in, in the adjusted image it is. Uh, combined with other elements of interference, they, they also contribute to both a misunderstanding of the image's features and the appearance of, of distortion. Um, the tilt of the head appears to be present on all three axes, X, Y, and Z, as shown. Uh, a comparison of the two sides of the area of, around the mouth and nose reveals the uniqueness of the shapes. Each side is distinctly different from the other. In fact, uh, there's not one shape in the image that's similar to any other shape in the image. Every shape is extremely unique. Showing also the, the tilt there. Um, you know, it looks like the head is slightly, again, uh, slightly tilted, turned to its right, slightly down. Obvious differences between the third and fourth quadrant uh, beard sections include uh, the distinctly different curl to the extension of the mustache. The curl in the fourth quadrant curls upward, and the curl in the third quadrant curls downward. It's a close-up of um, the eye in the uh, first quadrant. Um, the eyes are almost, I'm not gonna say they're oriental, but they're almost oriental in the upward slant and shape where the upper and lower eyelids meet. They're also small, and in close proximity to one another, one another in proportion to the very broad and developed cheekbones. I'll show in a moment. Here's a close up of the eye in the second quadrant. Same thing. Um, you can see it more clearly, obviously, in the enhanced version. Uh, 
though the mouth and lips are also small, they're even delicate, you might use that term, they are set within the, the frame of a very strong jaw area. The right side of the face below the cheek appears to have a deep set dimple that coincides with the edge of one of the bands and uh, the beard and the mustache are very full. The hair is long, definitely not straight. Um, it seems to be made up of small ringlets um, that collectively create curls or, or waves. Uh, the hair is somewhat similar to what I've seen in certain North African uh, races. Anyway, in conclusion, uh, there have been many theories about what is actually visibly present on the shroud, ranging from coins over the eyes of the figure that would provide an accurate dating of the shroud to floral patterns of specific botanicals indigenous to regions in Palestine. To, to actually, some people said they see inscriptions of ancient biblical texts and so on. And uh, it's understandable why such patterns might be recognized and such conclusions drawn. As I mentioned earlier, patternisti or uh, pareidolia, is that how you pronounce it? Okay, thank you. A new term. Uh, pareidolia is a, is a misperception where one sees something as clear and distinct when actually it's, it's really vague and obscure. It's sort of like seeing faces in clouds and stuff. Um, this study, my study, does not support the above mentioned theories. I'm not trying to, I'm not saying they, they don't exist, but I, I don't see them. Um, and that's because as clarification of the visual data progressed, what became increasingly apparent was the image of a human form. Yes, concomitant with other visual noise, but mostly human form. Uh, the challenge in clarifying the shroud image remained in recognizing the difference between visual noise and the actual image data. In essence, this is what people see when they look at the shroud. This is what's actually there. And yeah, that's what people see. And although there's some incompletion to my work, as I said, it's a, it's a work in progress and uh, very tedious. But um, so there are, you may call them mistakes, they're temporary. Um, but uh, that's what's actually on the cloth. I mean, there's a lot more on the cloth. I have to work on the hair more, and you know, as I said, every time I make an adjustment somewhere, it, it changes uh, things, but. Uh, so, uh, in answer to my, one of my questions was, is there a definitive likeness of the man on the shroud? This study suggests the answer is yes, with some qualifications. For the most part, the human form that is visible contains a depth of visual data that is far from being unclear or lacking in detail. However, adjustments were made to the luminosity in certain localized areas due to image drop-off of an extreme nature that was separate from the effect of banding. One explanation for these particular areas of image drop-off may be due to aberrations in the cloth drape during the time of Im image formation and the effect the aberrations had on the image mapping. It is reasonable, in my opinion, to assume that any aberration in the cloth drape would result in some degree of anamorphic distortion, however slight, when the image is viewed with the cloth completely flattened out. And it's the opinion of this study that some degree of anamorphic distortion does exist in the image. Interestingly, the effects of the banding in the region, um, let's see if I can bring this up here, in the regions to the side of the face, um, um, actually conspire somewhat to decrease the perception of the anamorphic distortion along the x-axis by narrowing the face. But in this case, the narrowing has nothing to do with the actual proportions and essential shapes of the image, and for the most part adds to the mis misperception and misrepresentation of the image. Although the distortion is subtle enough as to go almost undetected, potentially it, it's an influence in the viewer's uh, definition of the likeness. Um, a comparison 
I can bring that back. I'm going to say. A comparison of the face on the shroud from the original photo negative and the adjusted or enhanced version reveals some striking, strikingly different qualities in the viewer's experience of the two images. The original immediately brings to mind a scene of horrific brutality. Um, it's a reminder of suffering and brokenness. In this image, seemingly without expression, the man remains a mystery. The enhanced version relays a different message. The clarified image of the face on the shroud reveals more specifically a definitive expression on the face, perhaps the most sublime of all the features by comparison. Um, let me see if I can find out. Um, yeah, so perhaps the most sublime of all the features by comparison still within the anatomical boundaries that were even, uh, that are described above. <clears throat> it's an emblematic expression. The expression is immediately pleasing, even divinely sweet. This is the central jewel, as it were, the essential element to the definitive likeness, an expression eerily transcendent of what otherwise the blood-stained shroud bears witness to. To say that the expression on the face of the shroud speaks volumes is an understatement. It is remarkable that such seemingly random conglomeration of marks and shapes that in themselves resemble nothing recognizable other than visual noise when viewing the same marks in their entirety should capture so perfectly this subtle and enigmatic expression. Uh, I might add the expression almost seems to change depending on, on how the image is viewed. It can appear radiant one moment and then lovingly serious the next. Objectively speaking, this is because our eyes sometimes send mixed signals to the brain. For example, certain qualities to the overall countenance are more apparent in peripheral vision than dead center vision. Depending on what part of one's vision, peripheral or dead center, picks up uh, the image first, the brain's interpretation of an object's size, clarity, brightness, and location in the visual field is affected. But from a subjective standpoint, the expression of the countenance is naturally tailored to the individual viewer by way of their existing filters at the time. Sometimes one interpretation wins over the other and the expression is one way. Sometimes others take, take over and the expression is another way. Exactly what the expression does convey to the individual is somewhat like a, 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 like a secret world whose nature is unexpected, profound, and fantastic all at once. What are the artistic implications of a definitive likeness? The shroud has been referred to as a fifth gospel in that it bears an authoritative testimony to the reality of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The face on the shroud image goes into even greater detail concerning the man himself, as both the anatomy and expression are not arbitrary. Here is much more than an ambiguous facial similitude. Because of the depth of detail, the likeness bears an expression that clearly provides its own commentary on the recorded accounts of Christ. Most artistic portrayals of Jesus are radically subjective. The image as provided by the shroud is not so. As demonstrated by the study, the image on the shroud is very specific. And in this respect, Jesus is not historically alien, even in, even in appearance and attitude. So, uh, Christ said of himself in relation to God, He who has seen me has seen the Father. The mission of the shroud is to be the transparency of Christ and of his face. Human beings, in my opinion, because we can see, human beings have an inalienable right to be able to see the face of Christ and ponder him. To see the face of Christ is to gain understanding about the profound relationship between the human and divine natures. The accurately enhanced image from the shroud reveals a clear vision of this relationship in remarkable anatomical detail, even to the detail of a specific facial expression, an expression of equipoise and peace. Thank you very much.